this uh, talk is the consequence of an ambush. <laughs> uh, Claire uh, obviously wanted somebody to talk about knuckles, and uh, um, despite the fact that I knew then and hmm, partly now, no, absolutely nothing at all about Mackle, nor indeed about the village and the lovely church and so on. But anyway, I'm going to have a go. And uh, uh, so we'll explore this story together. And, and uh, at the end, you're very welcome to ask any questions. I probably won't be able to answer them, um, but, but do. Um, and it may well be that, that some of you know more about it um, than, than, than I do. And do chip in at the end and, and, and let us have the benefit of, of, uh, of additional material or indeed corrections for things that I no doubt have, have got wrong. Um, so, uh, I'm starting with, uh, with this, it's a lovely photograph of, um, uh, of uh, the church um, with the uh, North in the background and this um, stained glass uh, of, um, of St. Michael's. Um, well, the story of, uh, of St. Michael's was first written down uh, right about 807, and it's in the book of Armagh. Um, and in fact, it's in Northern Ireland that I'm going to take you now to start off the story that leads here. But it begins with a tearaway teenager, McCall. He's the chief of uh, a gang of young freebooting kerns, they would have been called, bandits, who terrorised the hills of Ulster. Um, and they were, these are the words of the 5th century Welsh historian Gildas. They were, he says, like worms, which in the heat of midday come out of their holes. This is in his account of what happened in the northern part of the British Isles after the Romans left. And he tells us that these characters were inspired by a thirst for blood and were more eager to shroud their faces in disguises than to cover the rest of their bodies with any clothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> And the Book of Armagh goes on to record that McCool was, here are the words, depraved in words, intemperate in words, malignant in action, bitter in spirit, quarrelsome in disposition, abandoned in body, cruel of mind, a heathen in life, and devoid of conscience. It's a good start. <laughs> and uh, McCool and his gang roam the hills in, in Ulster, setting ambushes for unwary travellers and seizing every opportunity they could to uh, cause mayhem. Now, the Armagh Chronicle doesn't pull any punches at all about the description that it gives of uh, McCool. But of course, it's to throw into dramatic contrast uh, the story of, of what happens later on. And everything changed when McCool uh, saw St. Patrick walking towards him. And the Book of Armagh tells us that he was shining in the clear light of faith and sparkling with the wonderful glory of a heavenly diamond. McCool hatched a plot to play a trick on Patrick to humiliate him and give the gang an excuse, it is being one, but a convenient excuse to murder him. And what he did, of course, was he hid one of the gang under a cloak, telling him to pretend to be lying in agony at death's door, and then challenge Patrick to chant some of your incantations and heal them. And of course, St. Patrick saw through the deception straight away uh, and 
And she replied, uh, it would be no wonder if he'd been sick. And he went off on his way. Then the pool lifted up the clothes. They all found themselves looking at the dead body. McCool's sidekick, Connor, rushed off after Patrick and begged him to come back. And he did, and he challenged McCool, why did you try to tempt me? And McCool, we read, was horrified by what he'd done. He was overcome with remorse. He begged forgiveness. He acknowledged the authority of Patrick and Patrick's God, as he promised, Whatever you tell me to do, I will obey. And so, Patrick restored the dead boy to life and he baptized the poor and the Jersey church window shows up. And as a punishment for his crimes, Patrick banished him from uh, Ireland, he cast him adrift without food and without drink, we are told in a boat made of one hide without weather or oar. With his feet uh, bound together in iron fetters and to be carried uh, by the wind and the tide to whatever land divine providence should lead him. And there to live and obey God's commands. And so it was that McCool's chronicle came ashore below Knackled Head, traditionally here, and there's a southerner, I can't pronounce that, is it? Right. There it is. You'll know and uh, you'll know where it is uh, in fact up right there. The traditional um, the traditional landing place. And he was found there, the oracle was found by two Christian brothers. They were Comendrius and Romulus, and they were the, the first two bishops of man. They carried the pool to a fresh spring, where of course he took his first drink of water after leaving Ireland. And then they carried him on to their monastic settlement, where they cooked for him a freshly caught fish. Remember, his ankles are shackled. When it was cut open, inside the fish, there was a key. A key to the iron fetters. And so, uh, Paul is released uh, from punishment, uh, according to Patrick's judgment. And he then entered the uh, monastic life and from this moment on, the Armagh Chronicler tells us that he gave thanks to God, conformed to the guidance of Pelindrius and Romulus, increased in holiness, and eminent in his miracles and virtues, he there remained and attained in time the degree of vision. So, in around 455, McCool became abbot of Mathilde and the third bishop of man. And there we are, we put him back into some saintly, saintly words. And of course, it's in the East Window in uh, such a church. So, what do we make of all that? Well, it's a, it's a fabulous story, it's a great story. Um, it's got all the right elements to grab uh, our attention. No less, of course, than it did centuries ago. Uh, and there are some other bits to spice it all up. Uh, for example, um, Mackle was given the nickname Cyclops, uh, one eye, but as a consequence of some banded enterprise uh, in which he lost the other one. And how does it all fit in with what we really know today? Um, 
The ecclesiastical affairs uh, of the monastic settlements of Macros came to be regulated from uh, Furness in Cumbria uh, following the establishment in 1134 um, of Russian Abbey, um, a land in the south of the island that was granted by King Olaf I um, to the abbot of Furness for that specific purpose. Fifteen years after the foundation of Russian Abbey, Jocelyn, who was a monk who came over from Furness Abbey, wrote A Life of St. Patrick. And it's in that work that uh, the stories of McCool and Mackles are, for the first time, overtly linked together. And Jocelyn used the Book of Armagh uh, as his source, but at the point where he records that McCool became Bishop of Man, uh, he switches the name to Mackles. All of it hates it. Well, Jocelyn wrote about the religious foundation here at, at Macrit. And this is what he says There was a monastic city called after Macrit of no small extent, the remains of whose walls may yet be seen. In the cemetery of its church is a sarcophagus of hollow stone out of which a spring continually flows. And Jocelyn and the Book of Armagh uh, make a great deal of the, the Mackerel Spring. And this is how he describes it. The water is sweet to the palate, wholesome to the taste, and healeth diverse infirmities and the deadliness of poison. For whoso drinketh thereof, either receiveth instantly health or instantly death. <laughs> in, that, in that stone, the bones of St. Macalvus is said to rest, yet nothing is found therein save clear water only. And though many have oftentimes endeavoured to remove the stone, and especially the king of Norway, who subdued the island, to take it with him so that he might at all times have sweet water, yet have they all failed. For the deeper they dug to raise the stone, so much the more deeply and firmly did they find it fixed in the heart of the earth. Quite a detailed description of something uh, which just certainly considers to be very significant. Well, we're already uh, trying to sort of unravel a mix of what we know and what the chroniclers want us to know. And uh, one of the biggest puzzles um, is trying to work out the dates of Matthew's consecration and, and death. Just before I go on to that, but do, do you all know that you're well where it is? Well, you put one of that would be one of my pleasures this afternoon is to go and uh, be guided and go and see it. Okay? Well, the dates. According to the hours of, of Ulster, um, he became bishop in 455. And that's 11 years after he's supposed to have arrived in Alcan. And he died in 488, this is in the Andrews of having served as bishop for 33 years. But there are other Irish sources that date his consecration to 498. That's four years after the death of St. Patrick. And the tradition is that St. Patrick uh, consecrated him. That Source, those sources put his death to 554. Um, 
And it was just interesting to reflect that God in those days, he would have led the Heinz Church as bishop for 58 years and then to be 110. <laughs> But what is sure that the dates are that his service as monk and bishop was long and, and venerable, and this also is certainly showing uh, that. If that's the case, then how did he, a bandit, a young Sir Roman Eros, how did he attain the sort of education you would need in order to be able to cope with the administration of a large monastic settlement? Who's been there? It's a mark, yes. Is that your mark? Yeah, that's right, yes. Um, I think the choir was there towards with the back, and he of course went there, of course, but their invitation to sing uh, the offices in uh, Spanish Cathedral in Alma a couple of summers ago. It's an impressive place. Um, so Patrick founded his church in Armagh in 457. And he said to have decreed that no one could become an evangelist unless he had been educated in Armagh. So, is there room in the story of uh, McCool that maybe McCool uh, at some stage becomes a student in Armagh? Before he got his proper book and was sent off over the Irish Sea. One of the uh, more discerning of the historians of our island's uh, history is um, William Sacheville. He was governor at the end of the, <coughs> of the 17th uh, century. He's of the opinion that Mackerel's probably led uh, an austere life uh, in the hills around this monastic settlement. Um, at least during the time of, of his um, episcopal predecessors, that's uh, um, an English first bishop of God was the second. And that after that, uh, even after he became bishop, he concerned himself less with what Sir Shekel uh, calls temple government. Um, and rather than with spiritual contemplation. So there's a sort of picture that, that we're invited to, to have on there. Um, so so Shemuel refers to Jocelyn's um, life of St. Patrick um, for further illumination, but uh, he's a very practical civil servant um, and ever the skeptic who warns his readers. He says, Jocelyn, quote him, had either a larger invention or was better informed than the whole of the rest of mankind. <laughs> <laughs> well, where might we go from these sources? Isn't that wonderful? Who's mm -hmm. been to Trinity College? Who's been to the library? Who's been to the library? The Armour Chronicler was writing uh, in the middle of the 7th century. So the work of Daniels, whichever dates we take, it's a hundred years after Matthew's death. Justin of Furness wrote his life of St. Patrick um, for Thomas, uh, Archbishop of Armagh, and his associate John de Courcy, who was the Lord of Down. Uh, and that's more than 500 years later. So we've got these two sources that we know about the Armagh Conifer and about Justin of Furness and the Russian. Well, the book of Armagh is in the library at Trinity College. The scholars have determined that it's almost certain that the manuscript was written by a scribe 
the Maori's name is Fair Dosma, and they've got a date about 807. And there it is. And because of its importance, it was enclosed in a silver case 130 years later because of the veneration. And then, later still, in 1002, that silver case, with the book inside it, was enclosed within this leather cover. And there is a speculation that the leather cover might have been gifted by Brian Brew, who of course is with a celebrated high king of the land. So that's the book of our man. Um, you will get this into Dublin just to see that. Mm -hmm. Jocelyn. Jocelyn was abbot of Russia in 1187. And at that point, he witnessed the Abbey Charter granted by uh, King Reginald, one of the knights being of the most kingdom. Here's an interesting link. Reginald's sister, Ofrika, it's A U F R I C A, was married to John de Courcy, Lord of Dan. And it's for him that Justin wrote The Life of St. Patrick. Justin was a distinguished and busy man. Um, he was the architect, as we know, of Russian Abbey. There's a little pillar base that it was, it was found in the Abbey excavations of this extensive period over the years of the giving up um, the, the Abbey. And in this tiny little pillar base is dated to the time of, of Joseph. He is also the architect um, of the chancel of uh, Old St. Jeremy's Cathedral. And I haven't picked the best photograph, I'm afraid, and I couldn't, and it's just the chances that they can't see it. But that, that <coughs> is attributed also to uh, Jocelyn as architect. And he's also uh, the architect of two abbeys in County Down in, in Northern Ireland, Grey Abbey and Inch Abbey. And both of those were built for the patron. The person. But whatever the truth of the story of Matthews, uh, for Jocelyn, he's very clearly a very important figure, not least because he links these stories across the Irish Sea from the glasses here and across to the glasses in Montana. Uh, this is sealed. This importance and significance of, of Abbott uh, it is clearly uh, marked by that. Um, and we want to read it a bit more. Then, of course, in Chronicle, uh, you can find it. Um, that's, of course, even later, but it's using sources that, that we've already been talking about. Um, and that, of course, is, uh, is a photograph of the original, which, of course, is not here. That is in the Another question for you. Who saw the original when you see that wonderful exhibition? Well, perhaps it would be. 1,500 years, that's a long time to try and untangle fact and, and fiction. Um, but there's one part of this extraordinary story that we can actually test. So let's have a look at that. Cast adrift on the Irish Sea 
in the boat of one mind. Is it possible to make a jury my boat of that dimension, not a pen, from the coast of County Down to the Isle of Man? On a carpool of one mind. Presumably, you have that Welsh river carpool there in the top. The top left. <laughs> Brendan, Saint Brendan of Clonfort, one of the Celtic evangelists sent here by Saint Patrick, is famed, of course, for the voyage that he made across the Atlantic, and that's first recorded in a Latin manuscript of 900. Um, it's, uh, it's a very popular story, describing the adventures that he had with whales, icebergs, volcanoes in Iceland, it's all there. And it was rewritten really countless times because it was such a popular story. And here's a, a great example of a, of a rewriting. Um, it's a 15th century German, high German manuscript. And it's a lovely picture. Um, you can count it, you've got it in the 14th, of course, in that sort of uh, soup bowl of a shape. Just a bigger version of the one at the top there. Um, and there's a layer of a refugee's there that's um, obviously persuaded you can't get up until it's easy to play. Um, <laughs> That's a wonderful you know, illustration of the start of that particular manuscript. It's one of lots uh, of, of, uh, of rewrites on it. Obviously, very popular indeed. But could a voyage like that uh, have been undertaken in a, a traditional Irish boat of bottle and animal skins? Um, and there's an nice photograph there of a seagull, an Irish seagull, uh, probably the lower one, which is uh, a bit bigger than the, than the river particle, but not uh, very much. Going back to 1976. Um, the adventurer and historian Tim Severin set out to prove the case. He built a brand new uh, of leather stretched onto a traditional uh, wooden frame, as he saw, um, <coughs> with traditional boat makers in uh, Kerry, in southwest Ireland. And he sailed 4,500 miles across the Atlantic. He went via the Faroe Islands, um, Iceland, to Newfoundland. So if you look at the map up in the top there, uh, you can see the, the, the line of the voyage, and there it goes. This is extraordinary, this is amazing. Uh, and there is the, the, the Brendan in the top right. You can see the design is, is exactly like Previous one traditional seagoing uh, Irish boat uh, and frame. There's another picture of it on the cover of, of the story of the voyage. And here he is, a little later in 1976, perched on the side of the of the hull where it is now and uh, still be seen in the southwest uh, southwest mountains. Four thousand five hundred miles. It's not that far. If you attempt it, I thought it was a fitting around and found this. This is an advertisement from, I presume that's how my cruises, um, who operated a water taxi from our glass at the Nazi Strangle up to Peel uh, for the TT. Yeah? If you 
Yeah, I'm just saying, I'm really this right. <laughs> well, that, there's a target for the adventurous among you. Um, and uh, the chart of the new classes, and he's 36 miles from my class. Um, or just a lot of people get to that amount of it, it's quite a lot across the field. Um, could, could Mapples, um, who is across there, have, um, have landed on the east corner of the island? Not that much further. Um, so tides and winds uh, certainly could have tied and landed on the corner there. <coughs> you know, where the map is on that on the map. Um, and perhaps he was on his way. Um, to the Southern Hebrides, to Iona. Um, his voyage, if he'd been going there, would have been a hundred years before Columbus got there, but still a, 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 an important Celtic Christian site. But if he was trying to get there, um, well, he would have blown off course on the North Channel and then by Well, that's an interesting uh, experiment in trying to work out what. <coughs> well, Mackle brought with him the seeds of what uh, would become one of the most distinctive features of the early Celtic church, the uh, hermit monks and the first women of Kiels. Mackle was already here when Brendan the navigator arrived from Clontarf to uh, evangelize the island. And German too, uh, as a German, his story is much more difficult to pin down. But he got here uh, from Wales via Ireland and meeting with St. Patrick uh, to become a bishop sometime after Mackles. The Keels, especially, um, hold the uh, the key to the hermit tradition. Mm -hmm. When you explore the church here and its surrounds this, this afternoon, is that you actually Yes, maybe if you get a chance to go around and look around, you'll be a distinguished uh, archaeologist and guide. Um, if you don't know the keels, then you'll be a way to, to, to go and explore them. And you'll see the three, the three keels on the ground. So a question now at this stage, how do St. Mackles, the Keels, the Well, the Church here, and of course the Crosses fit into the wider story of the Church in the Old Man? The Wells and Keels over time attracted the development around them of monastic settlements and the, the city of Mackle, that's what it's called, that early um, Extract that I quoted to you, uh, as recorded by Justin from the Furness, um, that became one of the most important of these uh, hermitage and keel sites. And the cluster of keels uh, <coughs> here may well reflect the attribution to, to Macwood uh, of the beginnings of some kind of parish system, um, perhaps linked to the uh, the fact that the monastic lands uh, centered here were very expensive. Um, you would need a convenient administrative structure for uh, a center that was growing in size and importance. Keels and the saints associated with them uh, became in turn places of pilgrimage uh, and so to, of course, to the wells. <coughs> to go back to the um, to Apple's well. The association of uh, St. Mackle's well with the story of the pool and his first drink of fresh water and its subsequent fame as a source of healing for sore eyes um, would have commended itself um, to travelers as a place of uh, a favorite place of pilgrimage. And uh, Ian, um, the folks, is, is currently researching the, the paths of pilgrimage uh, to the island from the top, furnace, 
and back your lips around and all the time, all of the time, so in fact, the images here in the map and some other elements science. It's a fascinating research project. The crosses are uh, particularly important uh, in the, the early history of the monastic community here. And in his book, um, Sir David Wilson says, the identity of a monastic community of Mackles depends almost exclusively on the carved stones and other archaeological remains found in the present day churchyard. These provide evidence of burial from the early Christian and Viking periods and of a knowledge of sculptural tradition, and that makes Mackles comparatively rare among British monasteries. Their gravestones uh, or memorials to the dead, most have got unique uh, inscriptions written in old, old Norse, the language of the Viking settlers. And they actually span uh, more than four centuries and they change uh, as they develop. The oldest of them dates to pre Viking times, right now. In the seventh, uh, the seventh century. Well, for all the, the abbots and the bishops who people the long history of Celtic Christianity, uh, only a handful are actually remembered by name, and of those that were associated with the island, the Minion, German, German, Brendan, Patrick, Columba, and Mackle, is Mackle, who is especially revered. Of course, as the patron saint of the Isle of Man. By the time we get to Bishop Simon in the early 13th century, the old Celtic Church of St. Patrick and St. Patrick has been um, pushed really to one side. Through the 9th and the 10th centuries, the Isle of Man became the administrative capital of. The Kingdom of Man in the Isles, the Norse Kingdom, and that was a vast Scandinavian maritime empire. It stretched 350 miles from the path right up to the, the nest of Butter Lewis, right up to the north. Of it. And its church, uh, as part of that Scandinavian diaspora, mm -hmm. um, came under the influence of Rome through Norway, not up through the south of the Irish Sea, but where it's not uh, from from uh, from the that's where it is coming from. When uh, in twelve ninety nine Bishop Simon established the diocese of Southern Man so the procedures across the Hebrides, and uh, set up a formal um, parish system to administer the, the, the diocese. At that stage, the Church of the Island was no longer linked to the Celtic tradition of Armagh and Iona, but to the Scandinavian uh, archdiocese of Nidaros. <clears throat> and this was the church that Justin was renouncing. And the cathedral of St. German and St. Patrick's High and Peel were being designed, uh, and its, uh, its two uh, sister cathedrals uh, were very far from, from the, the simple peels of the, of the earlier time. <coughs> Check this again. Who's been to Kirk Law and seen St. Magnus Cathedral? Um, who's been to Chantag in Norway? Right, yes. Um, we've all got travel adventure lists, I'm sure. Put these two at the top. Now, well, you know, it is. And we have our sister cathedrals, and for um, 350 odd years, uh, the diocese here was under the archdiocese of the as a people's uh, is St. Agnes in uh, the But 
this is where we start today. Uh, Mackle's <coughs> church was probably one of the monastic cells within the monastery, uh, as it was in the sixth or seventh century. In turn, they well have been uh, on the site of the field that was already here when Mackle's uh, arrived here. Uh, well, the time Justin was writing, you know, looking back at 85, it had already been extended and rebuilt, and today, of course, it is very much changed. But um, there was extensive work undertaken at the beginning of the last century, and that gave an opportunity um, to restore some of what remained of the, of the church as it is now from the 11th and 12th centuries. Um, the, the Western doorway. The top right there uh, is of um, Irish <coughs> Romanesque style. Um, that's from the 11th, uh, 11th century. Um, and that's before it comes under the, uh, um, the umbrellas of um, the control of the abbot of Fermat. Now, evidence of uh, Norman design from a, a little bit later can be seen in the north wall. Where the doorway has been blocked up, and in two lancet windows in the south wall. This can be took for the church as well. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, it would be great if you could see it with the garments. With the two lancet windows, um, one of those represents your work, uh, the, Scand well, the Scandinavian uh, bishops, the uh, man who died in 1060, and it was buried according to the Bible. Uh, at the church of Samantha. The baptismal font yeah, is a large piece of coarse grey brickstone which isn't found in the island. And it's Constance Ratcliffe uh, who, who wrote it because it was of Norman origin. And the present uh, East Wimble, of course, is a replica of this parish to so you can see the original as part of this weekend celebration. And that's made of the same stone as the sandstone as the parish cross, dated the 13th or 14th century. The two side windows at the east end may be of the same date as the, as the east east end. At the Reformation, when Russian Abbey was dissolved, the church outlawed um, shadowy Celtic figures like Mackles, but he stubbornly refused to disappear. He turns up in the Max traditionary ballad. The records of the Mackles staff members have clues suggesting that. The great saint had once worked in this area. The names of these two feast days are preserved in the next gale. And St. Michael's Fair continued uh, well into the 19th century. And then, of course, at the later in the 19th century, we have a tourist boom. And Michael emerges again, celebrated as a, as a place with a great story of an Max hero. So pilgrimages uh, are not only fun to become popular again. And in the Roman Catholic Diocese of Liverpool today, the Irish man is called the pastoral area of St. Michael. So that brings the story right back to the 